Hey church, I'm so thankful to be with you again. Today we're looking at Philippians 3. I hope that Philippians 2 has been amazing for you. I know it has been for me. It's incredible as we think about all that Jesus has done so that we can know him and have a relationship with him. And it's been so perfect that we were able to study chapter 2 right before Easter. As we jump into Philippians 3, I hope that you've been able to take the time to read through the whole book again. I know Paul's love for this church is incredibly evident and I hope you feel that my love for you is evident here too. I, I really hope that this gives you the tools and builds confidence in you how to study God's word and that it creates some habits in you that push you to study it daily and to make it practical in your life. Soaping can be done through any part of the Bible and I want soaping to make the Bible come alive for you. I'm going to start off this week with a few notes on Philippians 3. And like last week, I'm really excited to hear what you're going to be learning. I know I can't dig through every verse with you, and while I wish I could, I really am looking forward to hearing what you're learning and how you're applying it to your life. All right, so Paul starts off chapter 3 with a bang. In verse 1, he tells us to rejoice in the Lord. Now, I want to direct your attention to Paul writing, in the Lord here. He knows that without the Lord, we cannot truly rejoice. As followers of Jesus, our joy comes from knowing Jesus and our right standing with God because of what Jesus has done for us. This rejoicing means that we're going to stand out from the world around us who bases their feelings on their circumstances and what's happening to them. I think joyful people really stand out. And you probably know someone who loves Jesus who is really joyful. Maybe you should talk with them this week about how they cultivate that joy. Then in verses 4 through 9, we see Paul's response to some people who are trying to say that salvation comes by faith plus something else. However, Paul refutes that in his teachings as he shares about his life before following Jesus. He lists a whole bunch of credentials that are really interesting here. And if you have time, I would look through each of them individually, see what they each mean. I think it's also really interesting to see if you see any comparisons between your life and Paul's life and what he put his faith in. For example, he puts his faith in his family and parents since they were Israelites, God's chosen people. And sometimes we have put our faith in our parents or family because they're Christians or they go to church regularly. However, we know that only by faith in Jesus Christ, making him the forgiver of our sins and leader of our life is how we get to know him and have an eternal relationship with him. But are there other areas that maybe you've put your faith in before or even now that you thought made you righteous? Take a look. Then in verses seven through nine and verse 14, they are super popular in Christian culture. I'm gonna read verse 14 for you. It says, I press on to the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. You've probably heard that one a lot, but a lot of times these verses get taken out of context. Maybe take some time and soak through these verses and see how they fit in the context and how you can accurately apply them to your life. So then in verse 17, Paul tells the Philippian church to follow his example and those who live as he does. Now he's already given us some examples like Timothy and Epaphroditus from chapter two. Do you have someone that you can follow in Jesus Christ? Someone who can be a mentor to you in your, your walk with Jesus? Someone who's just a little bit farther along? Can you ask some good questions of them? And if you uh, don't have a mentor, how can you find one? Maybe you need to take some time this week and figure out how you can find a mentor. Maybe you need to be a mentor for someone else. And then my final note on Philippians 3. I love verses 20 and 21. They're the climax of this chapter. And Paul uses language that Philippians are really going to understand clearly as he talks about their citizenship. Philippi is a Roman colony, so they're living out Roman rule and culture in a foreign land. But Paul reminds us that our real citizenship is in heaven. This world is not our home. Our names are written in the book of life in our celestial home. We are waiting for a king to return and turn our frail and broken bodies into glorious ones like his. We are truly citizens of heaven. And if this is true in our lives, how does this change the way we live out our daily lives? Are we living like citizens of heaven on earth? All right, so as we turn our attention to soaping in chapter three, let me pray for us. Father, we are so thankful for your word. Thank you for how this book continually teaches us that you love us, even before we knew that you loved us. 
Father, thank you that your word is real and living. We pray that we would be sensitive to it and that we would apply it to our lives and be obedient to it. Thank you for your kindness in giving it to us. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, so now I hope you have your Bible, your notebook, and your pen, because you're going to pause the video in just a minute, read through all of chapter three, then go ahead and pick out the verses that you want and write those verses down. All right, so for scripture, I chose verses 10 and 11 of chapter three, and they say, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. All right, now that we've written down our verses, let's take another couple of minutes here, pause the video, and write down some observations. Remember, this can be why this passage jumped out at you. Maybe um, a, ver a, a verse or phrase really stands out, or you love a clause that Paul uses, um, or maybe it's just something you don't understand. You can always use the five W's too to help you, the who, what, when, where, and why. All right, let's make some observations. Okay, so as I look at verses 10 and 11, the first thing that jumps out at me is Paul's first phrase. I want to know Christ. I think as someone that loves and follows Jesus, this needs to be my attitude too. Paul was the only apostle that didn't get to meet Jesus while he was on earth. But we are told about his conversion in Acts 9, which we studied about a long time ago with Rob, that he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the Christians there when he met Jesus in a bright light that temporarily blinded him. This radically alters Paul's life. And he talks about it in verses four through nine of chapter three. When Paul talks about knowing Jesus, he's talking about it in a real and experiential way, not just a head knowledge or understanding of who Jesus is or what he did. And now he's telling the Philippians that even though you don't know Jesus personally, you can know him in this real and experiential way. And he's telling us the same thing. We can truly know Christ. So how can we know Christ? And this is my next observation. I think Paul gives us two really important ways that we can know Christ more. First, we know Christ through the power of his resurrection. If you follow Jesus and have made him the forgiver of your sins and leader of your life, you know that one day you're gonna meet Jesus face to face after your death. This is the power of resurrection. But I think you can feel really foreign and far away. I also think that the power of resurrection here is the power he gives us over sin and temptation and our old way of living before we knew Jesus. We are seeing some really tough commands from Paul here, just like rejoice uh, in the Lord from verse one. And we know that he doesn't give us an opt out clause here. He just says rejoice. However, we also know from studying chapters one and two that God doesn't give us a command without giving us the power to obey him. We know his resurrection power when we choose to listen and obey what he's told us to do. Secondly, I see that we know Christ through participation in his suffering, becoming like Christ in his death. I need you to know that the way that Paul writes this is kind of like a twofold on the power. We know Christ's power through resurrection. We also know his power through suffering. And we cannot experience the power of the resurrection without also experiencing his power in suffering. Jesus warned us that following him would not be easy and that we were going to face suffering. And as we study the book of Acts, we've seen that be very true from the early disciples to the early church and even Paul facing lots of different suffering. Suffering shouldn't come as a surprise to you. But I think what does always come as a surprise is how it's continually making us more and more like Jesus. Historically, we see the church grow as it faces suffering and persecution. We no longer have an option to be lukewarm about our faith. We are either in or out. And I think that creates a boldness in us that, and a desire to know Christ more that pushes us to pursue him even more greatly. As we know Christ through our suffering, we are made more like him. We choose the daily experience of dying to ourselves and living in obedience to him instead of our own desires. And this is the obedience that Paul is talking about in chapter two, verse five, where he's talking about having the mind of Christ. Christ's obedience and submitting to the cross, which opened a way for us to know him and have a lasting relationship with God. This obedience and service are the examples we're to follow even to death. And then this leads me to verse 11, which says, 
and so somehow attaining resurrection from the dead. Here, Paul is reasserting his confidence in his resurrection that after death, we will be raised to share in Christ's glory. In John 11, 25, it says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. This resurrection gives Paul both hope as he nears his end and it propels him to continue to know Christ more and more. All right, so now that we have our observations, let's take a minute here and pause the video and write out one or two practical ways you can apply the verses that you chose. All right, so my first application probably won't surprise you. I want to know Christ. So how do I do this? I spend time in the Bible. I look for Jesus there. I study it and I live it out. And I think both studying and living it out go hand in hand. We can't have one without the other. And you know what? This really kind of sounds what we're doing with soaping. I really want to encourage you here. Create a daily habit of being in God's word. Mark it as high priority, even if it's only for a couple minutes a day. Right now, this might be really challenging for you. You might have more people in your home. You might have different circumstances going on around you. You might have tiny people that wake up really early and it's way too early for you and makes it more difficult to be in God's word every day. But I know that you can do this. Maybe you're just struggling and this is just really difficult. God's word feels foreign and dry. I know I've been there. It's really hard. And maybe some of the people in your community group or that know and love Jesus, that love you, can help you and give you some good ideas to help you move forward. For me, the best way that I have found is just trying to talk with Jesus every day. To just spend conversational moments talking with him and telling him about my day, thanking him for the things that are going on, telling him how frustrated I am, or just asking for his help, just in little ways as you're walking around your house or doing daily things. And then, just by starting small in the Bible, maybe pick a U version plan that goes for five days, that is just a couple of verses every day. Do it and stick with it, no matter what. Start or get going. We know Christ by leaning into his word and by talking with him. So finally, I think we know Christ's power in suffering as our second application. As we look around the world, we see suffering in mass. The global church faces persecution that we will probably never even know or understand. However, this doesn't mean that our problems are insignificant or small. I'm convinced that we are all face suffering in different ways. What matters is how we choose to respond to it. Can we rejoice in the Lord? Can we choose not to argue or grumble? Can we see the opportunity to share our sufferings with people that we know love us and love Jesus and that can encourage us and lift us up in the process? Can we see suffering as making us more and more like Jesus? Let us learn to suffer not in silence or self-pity, but rather as people who see God working in us for his good and his glory and our good. So here we come to prayer and soaping. Let's just take a minute and write out a short prayer asking God to help us remember what we have learned and to take some opportunities to actually apply it to our life today. All right, so pray with me. Father, we are so grateful that you have loved us. Before we could even know who you were, you loved us. Thank you for having a rescue plan for our lives, for delivering us from our sin and self-righteousness, and by turning our world upside down, telling us to be servants like you. We pray that we would gain you, that we would know you, pursue you, press into you, that we would never give up actively following you, Lord, believing that you are worth the greatest pursuit of our life. That in knowing you, Father, we would know the power that raised you from the dead and gave us a new life that we would partner with you in suffering, joining hands with the church around the world as they face suffering and trust in your power to give us life and eternal hope. Father, that as we face difficult days that are unknown and feel unending, help us to rejoice in you. Lord, that we would remember that this is not our home. This is just a temporary place. Our citizenship is in heaven with you. Lord, that we would live this out to our neighbors, our friends, our family. That we would be there for them as they are searching for you in this difficult time. Father, give us grace 
Lord, we pray that you would bring a miracle. May your power be known throughout the world and in us. We love you and thank you for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for studying Philippians 3 with me. I'm looking forward to Philippians 4. I can't wait to see you all and I love you.